Cool. Is everyone able to hear me? I got you. Cool. All right. Um, I'm David Wise, art director here at MFG, a multidisciplinary creative practice that partners with brains and creatives to help push culture forward. Uh, I'm Maureen Mullen, a graphic designer at MFG. And we're both beyond excited um, to have Joel here tonight as the second speaker in the 2022 Ellipsis Lecture Series. Um, again, I've known Joel for quite some time and um, you know, beyond excited to hear what he has to, to say tonight. Um, throughout the past decade, Joel has led teams across various companies and organizations in exploring projects through art, fashion, graphic design, and tech that help initiate and inspire movements and ideas. His work has been taken, taken many forms from creating brands, campaigns, installations, products, websites, artworks, exhibitions, and more. Um, there's not any medium that Joel hasn't really touched. Um, and currently based in New York, um, Joel's focus remains within collaborating and working with good people in order to contribute ideas worthy of the world. Um, and like MFG, I would like to say, you know, to help push culture forward. Um, again, beyond excited and without further ado, Joel. Right on. Let's jump into it. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Boom. So when I'm presenting, I'm in full screen mode, so I can't see anyone's faces or anyone's questions. So I'm just going to ramble for however long we go, and then I'll see you at the end. So hello. Um, it's me, Joel Levy. Um, thank you, David and Maureen, for that super lovely, very complimentary intro. Um, Tonight, I, you know, it's lovely to be here and to speak and talk about some of my practice. And so tonight, um, I'm going to talk a little bit as about co-creation as a working method. Um, this is something that's pretty near and dear to my heart. And so I just, you know, like, um, I'm not always the most forthcoming with all of the work that I make. And so I wanted to give this presentation as really to talk about ideas and how those ideas have manifested over time throughout my creative practice. Um, this is sort of like going to be a brief overview of this topic, but I, you know, like we'll have time for questions at the end, but I, this is where I really felt like tonight would be the best place to focus. So path, what is path? Um, some people might know of my like creative studio entity. Um, path was formed as a, you know, Path was formed as like a studio idea or experiment. Originally it started around this idea of distributed work. You know, it was, right after the time that I had left Urban Outfitters, you know, um, 2014, 2015. And I was really thinking about how I could continue to work with interesting people, work with my friends. And so in some ways path, you know, you could call it, it's maybe it's an umbrella. Um, in some ways you could call it a bucket, you know, a container for things, container for ideas. But I really like um, this idea of the wagon wheel and the wheel and spoke model. Um, and yes, I left the stock photo watermarks in there because I think they look funny. So um, path was really an idea about working with friends. You know, I worked with many ex-urban people. That's how I know David, um, you know, and a bunch of other friends that have sort of come and gone along the way, a way to just bring people into the fold, you know, sort of like um, sort of co-produce, co um, sorcery, whatever you want to call it, you know, a way to put ideas together in a shared nature. And so it's friends and design, but then it's also friends and sculpture and music and installations and archives and video art and, you know, many different things. And so path really was this container to hold all of these interests that I had that like didn't maybe necessarily seem like they had, um, you know, one necessary home. Um, the other reason that it's kind of this like broader entity, it's also sort of like um, nebula-like is because there's a lot of other entities that exist within this. So this idea of the HH, you can see that path was, um, the idea of path with the double H was just something I was able to like pick up on and kind of use. Um, we live in the era of domain names. So you need something that like has a domain name hook and this was a domain name that 
get pretty easily. So from there, I kind of thought about like what other HH projects could I work on with friends? Um, and these are just a few of them. Um, a lot, probably a lot of people don't know most of these exist. Um, Path is the studio, but then light is a project I do where I make sort of, sort of sculptural lighting objects, candles. Um, you know, it's just a way for me to exercise some three, things in a 3D space. Sight was a live visuals project I had with a guy named Peter Steinick, who's incredibly talented. Um, and it was just live videos we were doing, live visuals we were doing for festivals and concerts and other things. Um, thought was sort of a strategy arm that I use from time to time. Cloth was like a textiles um, and surface materials exploration studio with my friend Steph. Um, and it kind of goes on and on from there. You know, there are many more. This is just the ones um, that were at the top of the list. Um, but it was just some things that we could do research as an image archive, you know, it exists on Tumblr, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of um, constructs or conceits to this idea of the double H, you know, it was something that I just felt like a way to group all these things together, obviously with path being at the very center. So input output, I mean, these are some maxims about things that I love, right? This is this is the kind of way that I work. And, you know, if um, I'll sort of show and demonstrate through some of the, the work that I show tonight that like, this idea of multiple inputs and sources um, is something that like I kind of keep doing over and over again with many different people and in many different forms. And so it's input output, it's a call and response, it's a fixed point and a flexible surface. Um, it's me plus friends, right? So it's like, these are all ways that the path entity has existed to sort of like bring ideas to, together and put them into sort of like a pressure cooker and see what comes out. Um, and so a word, you know, like, yeah, that sounds fancy, cool. What does that really look like, you know? And so, you know, here's just a few projects from the path era. Um, this was a book that I did for actual source, all of the content of which was sourced from John, who is the owner of a magazine shop in Philadelphia called Avril 50. And he was putting to, he was putting out updates about the new stock that was coming into this, into the shop. And so he would post them on Facebook, these little Facebook like haikus almost, like we have the great discontent or sometimes it would just be names of magazines strung together like um, Tank, Elephant, Fantastic Man is here. You know, there was some really odd things that I started to collect over the years and I thought that was a really interesting source material for a book that would later became like, um, you might call it country poetry, um, sort of just a little bit of a like written word exploration that me and actual source partnered together to put a book out. So it's like, Actual sources in the mix. John is in the mix. It's sort of my interpretation, um, but it was a really fun project to have these multiple sources that kind of all work together. Um, this this is a, a candle that I made with a lighting scientist and candle maker in Philadelphia named Ben Warfield. Um, this was one where we had this idea about lighting objects and what they needed to look like. What should a candle look like? And so this was one where we partnered together to make a run of these. Um, some of these also got sold by actual source actually, so double shout out. Um, but this was a really fun one to work with his prowess of natural beeswax making techniques and then sort of some of my ideas about aesthetics and how those two things could combine. So this is another fun one where it's just like, it's always these Venn diagrams of some idea that I have and somebody else that I'm gonna make them with. And you know, like how those two things bounce off and interact with each other is always fun because you're never totally sure what the end result will be. Um, this one that may be familiar from our very own David Wise. Um, this is the book series he puts out for, through his forthcoming studio um, called Assembly. This was one where, you know, I took all my images that I'd shot on film over probably the last decade and shipped them all over to him and said, let's do this book, you know. And so the sequencing is very much David's and it's very much his interpretation of what my images are and the content of them. Um, but then, you know, there's some collaboration that happens in the end on the covers and, you know, the spines and things like that. So there's a little bit of like, I make the images, I give them to David, he gives this the layout back to me, I put something on top of it, I give it back to him. So again, it's just very much this call and response. There's a sort of central nexus that things sort of orbit around till you get this finalization. Um, and I think that, you know, that's always the thing that is the most interesting to me. Um, this is another one. This is shout out to the Play Lab guys. We went to Romania and did this wild sort of um, workshop performance art piece. Um, 
where we had a <laughs> we had set this copy machine up like an altar in the center of this room and we had a plant that was sonified so it was like producing midi notes and making sound and when you touched the plant the sound would change so it was always kind of like echoing around and making these sounds in the space and the sound was responsive to the participants and on top of that we had gave them a series of prompts to make this zine um but the whole thing was supposed to be very unprecious sort of like anti-precious and everybody would start to make their work based on prompts we had given them and then we would make everyone switch their papers around we'd say all right that stack that you just worked on now give that to that person and they have to iterate on it and so that was a really interesting and a lot of great work came out of that workshop we had it all pinned up on the wall at one point um, but it was cool to see how people were responding to the space responding to us responding to each other their work was getting mixed up they were iterating on top of it just to sort of see what would emerge um, this is another one with david where uh david and i worked on this together on with path um this was one for the Columbia Printed Art Center. Um, this is just one little look at their stationery. The system is much larger. David did tons of work with it <laughs> once, once it kind of like got out into the world. So if you want to see more of this stuff, look at David's website, not mine. Um, but this was a really fun one where we were able to collaborate and work together and sort of like bounce ideas back and forth into something that overall became, I think, really successful and really fun. So um, this is an uh, incomplete look at this system, but it's something that definitely people should go and check out. Um, this is a screen capture of a video I did with Peter Steinick. Uh, we did this video piece. Uh, I think we had submitted it to a festival. It's um, I'll send around a Vimeo link at the end of the talk if anybody wants to watch it. it. I took a Drake song and slowed it down a whole lot. So it's like eight minutes long. It's a sort of eight minute long. Um, visual exploration of um, sort of ruin and modern internet culture. Um, it was just a fun one to work on. This was one that was purely an art piece. You know, it was just us looking at and referencing older video artists from the 80s and trying to make our own version of that using some of the same tools. A lot of it is like done very analog through these like de-resing systems that we were using. And um, Peter Steinick, incredibly talented, another shout out for that guy, but this was a really fun piece that the two of us one worked on together. And then that brings me to this project, which I have a few, um, few examples of it to show, but the Gap Editions project. And the Gap Editions project, for people that aren't familiar with that, was a project I ran internally in our creative team to just give photographers or image makers that we knew carte blanche to interpret the Gap brand. You know, it was just, go make something, see what it looks like, see what it feels like. Um, and again, this was one where it was really interesting to get people's responses and results because it's people taking an idea of something, filtering it through their lens and then giving it back to me. And that was the thing, you know, I'm, to be honest, I'm quite bored by my own ideas, right? You know, it's like, I have to sit with myself 24 seven. So it's always really, really um, invigorating to me to like give someone a prompt and see them come back see them come back with something that like i wouldn't have done myself that i wouldn't have expected you know all these sorts of things and that's where this like input output i think is really successful so um gap editions like i said an internal project we ran at the gap team some stuff made it out into the broader world some didn't um, but we have this whole archive of amazing incredible work that different creatives and photographers sort of like produced for us in partnership with us here's another example um, here's another example we did. This was a big newsprint scene. Um, the photographer Ian Kenneth Bird shot this and Adam Ridgeway designed it. Um, super cool, it feels very gap. You know, it's like these were us exploring new ways of interpreting the same idea, you know, and we were kind of always doing that. And I think that's the thing that felt really interesting and successful. So those are a few things. Those are just a few things from the past of like the world of, of let's call it path and associates that um, I've had the privilege of making and working on with other people, other talented people. And so at this point, you know, I always joke that I always make the same picture, um, that I'm always over and over again, trying to resolve the same compositions. You know, it's like, maybe formally they don't look the same, but conceptually they sort of are. It's me like, no matter what medium, you're always sort of making the same thing over and over again to sort of resolve it. And so 
that idea of co-creation, that idea of like less boundaries, that idea of fluid responsiveness. Um, I recently had the privilege of exercising those ideas and sort of playing with them at a really big scale at a brand, sort of a more brand level scale, um, which is something that maybe I, you could sort of say I did a little bit when I was at urban um, in some ways. And then at some of the other jobs I've had in the past at a gap, for example, you don't get that opportunity as much. It's more and sort of like end outcome. You're sort of working with images and things, but not touching the core identity of the brand. And so I wanted to see what these ideas would look like as the core identity of the brand. So, Grail, um, I, as some of you may know, um, I'm the creative director of this brand, Grail. Um, there are a marketplace for style, um, I think is probably what they would like me to say. Um, it's secondhand um, fashion resale. So right now it's currently really centered around the men's market. Pretty soon that will change and it will include women's too. Big shout out, that's a reveal. Um, but Grail, so, Grail, why do that? Why go there? What about it is interesting? And when I was offered the job there, I think it was had a staticness to it and a singularity to it, which I felt like really wasn't going to work super well going into the future. And so that's why it was a really interesting challenge for me to work on. Um, old Grail felt a lot like this. Um, it's kind of a very singular perspective on fashion. Um, it's a little bit sort of like, High end maybe is a word you could use. Exclusive is maybe a word that you could use, but it's not very broad and it's not very open. It's maybe not very approachable to people who are just trying to figure out where they're at in their journey with personal style, right? Um, this is something that's maybe like a little more severe or unapproachable. So after working in the brand internally for a while and trying to suss out like the core values, the core DNA, how we were going to kind of evolve in the future, um, we undertook this project to do a little bit of a rebrand and to see if we could push and pull against some of these ideas I have about co-creation and co-authorship and flexible systems into a larger brand context. And so the inputs I was given from a marketing perspective was that we're, Grout Brand is the pioneers of the fashion revolution. Um, the mission is to no, enable the global style community to take control of fashion commerce. Our community is fluid um, with interests that are constantly evolving. And our, my task was a new visual system that can flex with those interests, you know, trends change, tastes change as a marketplace rather than a mono brand. We needed something that was incredibly flexible and could sort of move and change over time. Um, and so that was really the, the big task at hand, our big undertaking. And so this is a kind of section where I show some images. It says, so I say, we needed a brand that feels like, and we need one that feels like this and like this and this and you get the point right so it's like all of these things need to make up a brand that exists in contemporary fashion today and all of these images are ones that we've made so far these are all brand images um, that we've made during my time at grail and so like just going back through them so i don't don't skip over them too fast screenshots from instagram content um, campaign images still life um, stuff I shot on my iPhone, believe it or not, for like an activation we needed to do really quickly. Um, collaboration with Arcturex, you know, like these are all really fun projects that we got to do and we got to execute them in a lot of different styles to try this out, to see if like we could do something that felt broad and really approachable and fun. You know, it's like feels cool, but it still feels fun. Um, and so that was something that we were really trying to push forward, this new aesthetic, this leaving this kind of like black and white starkness behind and trying some new things. So it's taken a lot of different forms. Um, but, you know, ultimately this feels a lot more in line with where fashion is today rather than some of the images I showed you before. And again, you know, representation matters, getting, showing different people in our photography rather than you know, the typical Anglo-centric version of fashion that I think a lot of people are used to. So um, the new guiding creative principles, you know, as we started to put this stuff together, this was a way that I tried to codify a little bit some of the ideas that I had. And you're gonna, you'll see some familiar wording here. So this, this is something that I've talked through with our executive team, which is like, the Grail is a, a 
a platform, which is this fixed point. Remember before I showed this fixed point, flexible surface, sort of like dualism. So I kind of brought that back here because it's like, that is the Grail brand. We are this one nexus where the community is at the center and that surf center and that surface is always flexing. It's always moving. It's always changing. It's always evolving. Um, so this is what we kind of sold as the underpinnings of this new brand system. So fixed point, flexible surface. And so um, we say it's a new way of seeing. I'm going to play this video that we used as a scissor reel. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear the audio um, because I'm wearing my headphones, but let's see if you can. And so this is kind of the final encapsulate, you know, like all the video we showed in that scissor reel was all stuff, again, that we had made, that we had produced. And so you take that many different things and you put them together and you say, but yeah, but how do you represent that in the logo? And the answer ultimately was an animated logo. And that's what you'll see currently today on the homepage of the website and in the app. Um, the thing that, the other thing about this that's interesting is, and one of the ways that we sold this is, the logo, the, this animation that you see today will not be what it is in three months from now. Um, it will continue to change and evolve over time and we'll replace it, you know, subsequently. Um, but as I say below, the change agents are like seasonal campaigns. Maybe we want to partner with an artist and they're going to make a version of it. Maybe um, cultural calendar events, sort of like a Google may, might do, you know, things where we want to change it to respond to some input. Um, those things I think can all be on the table here. And so this is just the first iteration of this morphing, changing, iterating logo. Um, but this was kind of our final summation of like, how do you make something that sort of represents change ongoing? And I think because we're a digital product that doesn't have a lot of need for printed materials, honestly, that's one thing about great thing about working in this startup environment was we were free to do something like this and make this our primary logo, whereas some a traditional brick and mortar, um, somebody that maybe has a lot of physicality, a lot of signage, wouldn't be able to do something like this. So um, it's cool to work in a new digital space where there's a little bit more freedom to try things out. Obviously, you can't always have a moving logo. Um, so we made the second version, which we call the freeze frame, um, which is our sort of like still version of this logo. Um, we needed to just align on one mark we could use um, when we just needed to have something that like kind of stood in for the moving version and ultimately this is what we landed on um, some people call it the race car logo i prefer the freeze fan but you know you get the picture um, so more to come there as i said like you know this will evolve over time this is something that we won't just begun on um, and it will continue to go into the future and I feel like I really burned through that really fast. Um, so I look, I'm looking at my clock, it's only 8.30. Um, I've really crushed through that. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. If people have questions or just wanna chat or just wanna whatever, let's do that. Cool. So what happens when I get excited, you know, I'm just going to like run through it. That's how we go. So get me with it. Um, cool. Yeah. I think so b before, before we kind of open up and like go, go with the questions, one, like one thing and you know, maybe this thread isn't there, but like, could you talk a little bit about 
a little bit more about like research because I know research over time, you know, research is on Tumblr. Tumblr at one point went through um, a sort of like not safe for work, a kind of like whole image rights and like image use thing a few years ago. There was like the sort of like deep cut of like ripping that down and then putting it back up. But then also like this idea of like, what does, what's the relationship for you within your practice between like image collection and image making? And then how that image collecting and image making help to inform, you know, some of the decisions that were happening um, at Grail, you know, and helps sort of push and like define what, it, what community centered fashion is, you know, there. Right, right. And what your, your question is really a question about subculture and the tracking of subculture. Because like, if you were on Tumblr three years ago, you would have known that Demna's Balenciaga show on the New York Stock Exchange with like, you know, sort of bondage costumes and Adidas tracksuits was gonna be coming, right? Like the, the sort of signs for that stuff, how people sort of mine the archives of the past. Like if you have, if you can, if you can sort of have your eyes open to witness it, you can see the signs pretty clearly, you know? And so like research is something that I've just run on Tumblr for a long, long time because um, Tumblr, this is not a Tumblr plug. I'm not sponsored by them in any way, um, fair warning. But I find it much more interesting for me to look at rather than Instagram because very few people, at least that I follow on Tumblr, um, it's not centered on them as themselves. It's not centered on their personal identity. It's centered centered on this idea of this curation of taste or this curation of style. And so research has been really interesting to me because I can watch and see the things that get reblogged and the things that get a lot of notes. And like, maybe some of that stuff is going to be two years early, but eventually it always comes out in the mainstream somewhere, you know? And it's like, that's why, you know, that's huge right now between Yeezy and the stylists that were around him for a little while people like Julia Fox, you know, you can see all of these people and their aesthetics got like early, you know, earlier on one or two years ago. So we're starting to get more and more popular and you'd see it more and more. And then eventually that stuff always pops up in the mainstream. Right. So, um, you know, following everything from like cyberpunk digital art to deep cut fashion archives, you know, there's like a lot of stuff that I follow in there and all of that stuff over time maybe not all of it but a large percentage of it over time i see kind of like pop up in the mainstream here and there you know like it's going to be the imagery will be appropriated by this dtc brand and that big fashion house and this other you know like aesthetic gestures that get picked up by dropbox you know like that stuff kind of like lives everywhere and it's just for me and my practice it, it kind of like behooves me to see that stuff early and sort of anticipate you know like what's going to happen next what is culture going to look like what's you know, one of the things that to that point, you know, David, the work that I, I've been doing with Grailed and a lot of the image making, um, selfie culture and people's use of like 2000s era digital cameras with these like hard flashes and pe people's image making using phones and like the hyper zoom that you get on phones, the aesthetic of the hyper zoom. Um, we, I was seeing that stuff a lot, like bounce around the internet, you know, like these kids just posting images that were shot that way, you know, shooting stuff for themselves, putting it on their blogs. And so, you know, that's why we made a little bit of a pivot um, just shooting stuff that way ourselves, you know, like there's some stuff I shot on my iPhone, which I kind of called out. There's a lot of videos that we pivoted away from actually using a good legit camera crew and just use iPhones on gimbals because that felt, these are the tools that every like kid that's like interested in fashion has in their hand, you know, and like, everybody's got their burner Instagram account where they're just posting weird stuff on it, you know? So we kind of leaned into that. I was like, let's not be afraid of like digital nativism. Let's like lean into it and see what our take on that is, you know? And, and there are some people out there in the world doing really interesting stuff, just using iPhones and other like really low res, low fi equipment, you know, like fashion is so sculpted now. And so research ties into this way of, and maybe that's just one example, but research was a way for me to like, track what was happening in visual culture and then be like, all right, what do we want to tap into? What do we want to sort of play off of, you know? So that's maybe an answer to your, to your question of like, how did it exist in a real space? You know, we started changing the way we physically make our images because of that. Cool. Yeah, I think like that idea that you just said is like 
between the short play and the long play is like an interesting kind of conversation, you know, to like kind of think about when you're sort of propagating and making the new. Um, so we have a, I'm going to just kind of go down the line and we'll try to get in as many of these questions as possible. So the first one's from Ruby uh, Barrett. And the question is, can you speak to the challenge of defining a brand without having a very solid mission? Yes, I mean, great question. Um, I think that's kind of why we had to do what we did. We didn't have a super solid mission, you know, like a lot of Grail's mission is about empowering other people. And so it was like, and a little bit more like behind Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. We tried to do the rebrand of Grail one other time before what I'm showing you, there was another version of the rebrand that was done with an external agency. And ultimately that was a learning experience for me because all of the different partners within the company disagreed about what the individual single mono brand version of the Grail identity was going to look like. None of them could agree, even among the founders. So some people thought one version was cool. Some people thought another, and it ultimately like kind of fell apart because it didn't have a solid mission there. Even among the people that worked there and started the company, there wasn't a solid understanding about like, what does Grail feel like today? And so maybe that's a long winded way of not answering your question. Maybe that does answer your question, but I think the, the results you're seeing are how we got around it, you know, which was just like, it's about community. We know we are a marketplace, not a mono brand. We know we have a community. We need to cater to their interests. How do you do that? All right, let's just make it flexible. Let's make it evolve over time. Let's make it something that isn't fixed. So. Yeah, we have a, another question uh, from Nikki Dolan, uh, who's also a graphic designer at MFG. Um, they said, hi, Joel, I love your work, especially in fashion. I was wondering, in all your work, how do you push yourself to create something different? Is there a certain part in your process that is crucial for that? Um, also, have been following your work since you gave a talk in one of Peter Steinick's classes almost three years ago. Very cool to have you here tonight. <laughs> Shout out Peter Steinick. Um, yeah. Well, first of all, shout out Peter Steinick because he runs a studio now called Heck with his um, buddy Michael. They are going to do great things. He also runs this animation festival called Hellivision, which um, is amazing and everyone should check out. One of the, the key tenets of Hellivision was that like nobody should get told no or nobody should get turned down and that they would like accept all these submissions. So um, you know, I don't know, big fan of that guy. Can't say enough good things about him. But um, the question is, how do you push yourself to be different? And how do, do you just continue on this path? I think, I think there's two things. I think there's two, a two-fold answer to that, which is like always remain curious as like a lifelong skill because like I don't, I don't actively maintain a presence on Tumblr because I'm not, I'd say I do it because I'm curious, right? Just because I'm like, what else is out there? What haven't I seen yet? You know, in some ways it's me keeping a running list of things that are new. And so one way is curiosity that you're always feeding, you know, like what else is there? Um, and then the other way, which is like a technique I picked up when I was in school, which is if you're going to make something, make the weirdest thing you can think of. And then the next time you make it, try and make the next weirdest thing you can think of and top the one that you did before and try and keep topping yourself in the level of like what's out there, out thereism, um, because that will keep you away from the pressures of what do people expect me to make? Or what does, in my case now, what does the company I'm working for expect me to make? What is, what does our followers expect me to make? You know, once you get into this trap of like trying to just design to what people expect of you, you'll make things that are maybe, well, I don't know a good way of putting it, but they're just not gonna be as interesting as you want, right? You'll make things that are derivative, maybe is a good way of putting it. And so to keep pushing yourself, to keep challenging yourself, to try and like, always top your old work to always be curious about what's out there. You know, like um, there was that one screenshot in the presentation. That's like a guy in a bunny suit holding Reese's peanut butter puffs, you know? And like, that was something that like was a small part of a video piece that we made. But to me, that was my favorite image in the whole thing because it was so out there. I was like, this is the work that's going to like 
make people stop and look at it rather than just being like, Oh yeah, another photo shoot. Oh yeah. Another video, you know, like those are the moments where you like hone in on the weird and it's just training yourself to recognize them. Ah, oh, that's really weird. Let's do more of that. Let's see more of that. Let's dive in there. Let's double click there. You know, um, I don't know. Maybe that's again, long winded answer to your question, but I would just say like, always try and leave what you did last month in the dust and find a new source, something that's weird, something that's interesting that like you can kind of fold in and make your own, you know, like what about it's weird. Maybe it's a form, maybe it's just a concept, you know, and you're just like pulling things in, you know, and this is what all the big fashion houses do to try and one up themselves or move with the speed of culture. You know, they're just, let's make it weird. Let's go farther. Uh so I'm going to skip one question to go to a question that I think is like a good follow up to this and then we'll go back. So with that said, I think, you know, this is, this is very pertinent. Like, what do you do when you encounter a client who, you know, it, it's difficult to sort of push that client outside of their comfort zone in order to sort of try those things, right? Like when you don't have the opportunity or at least a, a solicited opportunity to kind of push those boundaries, how do you negotiate that conversation? Um, Ooh, wow, the hard hitting ones tonight. I mean, how nice do you want the answer to be? Is the question to that? You know, like uh, thanks, Kurt Austin, for this question. Yeah, yeah, know. Kurt, shout, shout out. Um, I don't know. There's like there's a lot of answers to that question. That's incredibly broad, and I would say. I'm not trying to dodge your question, but like, there's a lot of avenues, right? Like you could just show them one option or you could show two options and one of them's really crap and one of them is your weird option, you know, and hope that they pick that. Um, charisma and presentation skills are also incredibly helpful. Um, at this point at Grailed, I'm like 30% a creative director and 70% like sort of a shepherd vibe enforcer. You know, I just, you know, go to meetings where my art director and designers have made really interesting work and then it's my job to like sell it. You know? And so like that is hugely important and your sell, the way you talk about your work, the way you can sort of like um, embody the work personally, you know, if you really care about it, I find that a lot of people, when they're judging creatives um, have opinions, but they don't really have deeply held beliefs about things. They just think something is arbitrarily this or that it's a good or bad. And so like a lot of times clients come to you because they're looking for you to embody the presence, the physical presence of your good idea. And so it's like a lot of it becomes the cell, you know, like um, is another huge way that you have to get it done. You know, like um, just selling things and be able to, being able to talk about them really charismatically, you know, and that's a skill that you develop over time. Um, believe it or not, from this talk tonight, I am actually an introvert, but you kind of have to have this presence that can sell work and be um, really inviting and magnetic to kind of get that stuff done. And then there's other ways too. Uh, there's that famous story about that art director from Vogue in Europe in like the 70s or something, or maybe it was the 80s. Maybe somebody that's on this call will know actually, but who didn't like any of the selects the editor made for this issue of Vogue. And so like, on press switched them all to his selects like on press at the printer like switched all the selects in one like copy of the magazine and then just like after that got fired but like that one issue was really a heater so you know like there's options like that too if you want to hit the self-destruct button you can also just pull something like that and turn in files that are all the ones that you want instead of the right ones but you know choose your own adventure your mileage may vary um cool um We'll we'll do a few more in. I don't want to you know keep keep you too long. Um, as, long well, as, as long as you're willing. Um, well, I mean the question the question and answer part to your point, David. Question and answer part is one of the funnest parts of these presentations for me. Again, because it relates to what I just talked about, which is there's this like call and response between like people asking questions and me answering them. I vastly prefer Q and A's than talking about my own work because I'm already so bored of it. So yeah, <laughs> it's nice to just that's like that's chat that's with people. That's why you forcefully like move, move through, you know, you like force the situation. I'm just, I'm just trying to hurry up to get to the Q and A. That's really all I'm doing. Uh, this one's from Jonathan Jensen, uh, former sort of collaborator here at NFG as well. Um, he, has, he has two questions. Um, what made you decide to transition to creative direction instead of keep, keep being a graphic designer? 
Um, and then what is something you wish you knew five years ago that you do now? Mm, great question. Um, the transition to creative direction happened. And this is partly my personality. So like, I'll get, I'm going to give you an answer, but part of it is just the way that I'm wired, which is like, to be quite frank, I got bored of it because I understood the confines of the sandbox. Like graphic design at a certain point, I understood where the edges were, you know, to some extent. And I realized that to run the experiments culturally that I wanted to run, I couldn't continue to do that just thinking about like a specific typeface or a poster or, you know, sometimes graphic design can be very output oriented, right? It's about the thing and I love the physicality of a book and I love the way the posters look, uh, poster looks, don't get me wrong. Um, but I wanted to start playing in spaces that were bigger than I could physically make myself at one time, you know, like um, I wanted to know about video. I wanted to know about film. I wanted to know about sound. I wanted to know about how like a lot of uh, some of these other mediums could all work together to make meaning, you know, like, um, and so at this point I've done everything, but like, direct a feature film you know so i've like done photo shoots and i've made books and i've made posters you know so it's a lot of times it's me experimenting with things that are like outside of my realm of understanding and then i go and i experiment with them until i feel like i have a somewhat working understanding of, of them you know and then i go and try and make something else um and so that's again goes back to this path idea where there's all these like subdivisions of it where there was were all things that i was doing with other people yes but also trying to teach myself and like educate myself about so that's kind of an answer i think a lot of times people transition from graphic design to creative direction to like yeah, be able to touch more things quickly you know once i have a team that i work with now at grail you know i can kind of set them loose on a project and then you know see much more quickly than I could myself if I was just making it myself, like what the results are, you know? Um, I think that's pretty satisfying for me at this point. Your second question is, what is something you wished you'd do five years ago that you do now? Hmm. Great question. I don't know if I have a good answer to that one. Probably have fun and that things are less serious than you think they are. Um, but I, you know, like, go on long walks, you know, like, I think these are the things that like, as a younger creative person, maybe not five years ago, but maybe like 10 years ago, you know, like, there was a point in my career where I really thought that the work was the ultimate thing. And, you know, like, now more and more, it's the people that you're with that you make it with that like, you'll remember, you know, like, the best graphic designers that are not very nice have stacks of books in their house and nobody to show them to. So maybe that is like a good example. Um, what's, what's another one? Isn't, Hit me with it. Isn't that the truth, man? Um, that's like a lifelong battle. Um, yeah. So one of these, one of the questions um, is what is it like um, working with non-creative teams at Grail? And how did that differ from working with those at Gap? Hmm. That is a really interesting question for a graphic design lecture. Uh, it's much different just because of the organizational size and people's reasons for being there and, you know, like, the mandate and the remit of the company, you know, like Grailed is much different because it's a startup and it's a startup that's like, there are some fashion people at Grailed, but mostly it's engineers. I gotta be honest. And a lot of engineers are actually like kind of nerdy, nice, interesting people. They have very different life experiences and stuff that they're into. And the one connection between everybody that works at Grailed is they all love techno. That's one cool thing. Um, so it's a lot of techno talk, but like, that's the difference is just like Grailed is a startup. Uh, there's a lot of young people that want to work in a startup. Gap was not a startup. And there were a lot of people that were careerists that just wanted there because they wanted to have a job, you know? So Grailed is interesting in its energy, its coalescence of energy because people there are, are trying to do something interesting and new and they're willing to put in like the time and emotional energy to do it. And so creatives or non-creatives, you know, a lot of times, um, 
crowd people are very supportive and really get excited about things. You know, they really want to participate and understand the work and are very supportive of it. You know, and like everybody on my marketing team that that works with me, we all we'll all hang out at my house, you know, and we'll all like smoke jewels together in the backyard or whatever. You know, it's like a lot more of a collaborative environment where people are just interested in moving forward and trying new things. So like that's fun. Cool. Um I think so you got one. Okay, that was my question. <laughs> hey, Talia, the place. That's why I was like, okay, I just need to give it a little context. Um, yeah, cool. That that is the difference, Talia. And for everybody else on the call that doesn't know Talia and I used to work together at the Gap. And yeah, Talia, that's the difference. People at Gap were just there to have a job. People at Grail are there because they're like want a job in a fast-paced startup environment. It's like has a just a little bit more you have a little bit more leg room you know gap was thousands of people grailed is like a hundred right so it's like i can get on a music meeting and physically talk to everybody that works at the company and talk to them about our work you know and there's a slack channel where it's just me we have a slack channel called creative team scrapbook it's literally just me dumping screenshots from my desktop into a channel of like weird shit that i see just to like set the vibe and set the intention you know, and that I think gets people on a same page, a common understanding, um, whereas like that was impossible at some place like Gap. Yeah. So uh, for the rest of the group, insider baseball between me and Talia, but uh, yeah, that's the difference. Uh, so I, I think we'll end it with this one. And this is something that I, I love talking about, love hearing about and love thinking about. Um, so this is from Lucas. With so much design work now being postmodern, and an interpretation of past aesthetics or identities. How do you imagine a future of genuinely fresh perspectives? And to kind of tack on to that, to maybe like distill it down, in a visual culture that finds so much energy and satisfaction, like looking backward and remining that, how do we think about and imagine a future of like genuine newness? Um, you know? if possible, your, your sort of take on that. Oh, genuine newness. Um, I'm saving the really good ones for last. I love it. I don't know. That's a good question. And that some of that, like, and, 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 you know, like outside of, uh, you know, let's not even say genuine newness. Let's just say newness, because there, there's no need for the word genuine if it's if it's truly new. Um, I it's I think it's going to be really dependent on the tool sets that people have access to, right? And so, like, we're going through two things at the same time. Time, right? One is the condensation of visual culture, where everything could be everything all the time. And I see Kurt, I see you in the chat, you know, and this is about what to be what I'm going to say. Um, but, you know, Von Dutch is cool again. Juicy Couture is cool again. You know, pretty the cycles of trend are getting shorter and shorter and shorter, you know, and we're referencing things that were like cool three years ago now. You know, it's like it's this cycle of of reference is getting shorter and shorter. The wheel of style, as Lorraine Wilde called it, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller as things move around the wheel of style. Um, and so I'm interested to when that singularity happens where it's just everything all at once and you're referencing the things that were cool a week ago and then went out and went back in again. But then the other counterpoint to that is that visual culture is incredibly dependent on the tools that it uses to create that culture. And so right now I talked about leaning into the digital native aesthetics of shooting on iPhones and selfie videos and hyper zooms, you know, and how we're kind of participating with that. But like for people that are aware or even aware of the Instagram trends in the last week, you know, like Dali and AI generated imagery and, um, you know, things, you know, once you have an AI that can like produce images for you, based on a text prompt or a voice prompt or whatever, I think like you're going to start to see that melding of like machine learning and people where, you know, that will be able to produce images that are incredibly unexpected that I haven't thought of, you know, and that's, 
we'll see this condensation of culture on one hand and this exploration into new tools. Maybe it's not AI, maybe it'll just be new ways of making, you know, like we also use a lot of 3D scanning apps at Grail to make video content of using like that you normally would scan a room with or something for architectural purposes. And we'll, we just actually dropped a video today on our Instagram that's all fashion product that we 3D scanned with an iPhone to make a video out of. And so like those are going to be those overlaps between like new tools and like sort of these condensations of ideas. That's where you'll get these little explosions, you know, anytime it's like, it's like, um, so this idea of the big bang, right? When things condense too far, they'll kind of blow up again. And you'll just see that kind of cycle happening over and over where that like something will pull together and then new tools and it'll blow up and it'll come together and it'll blow up. So um, this a long winded answer to your question, but that's what it feels like. That's where it's where I see the newness happening. It's like this merger between ideas and tools and new forms and things like that. So, okay. yeah. Amazing. Um... Yeah, it's great. Um, again, this was this was a real honor. I think it was it was really interesting. Um, so I was happy we blew through to get to the Q and A. Got like a lot of yep. rich ideas and a rich, rich output. It was cool seeing some of your work um, and like hearing you know what it's like being at a you know going from a, a larger company to a smaller company and what it means to be making and producing culture you know through through those organizations as vehicles and. Um, again, we appreciate you sharing that tonight. Um, yeah. Yeah, man. Uh, thanks for asking me. Thanks for inviting me. Um, it's always a privilege to get to hang out and chat about work. And shout out to all of the homies I know in the group chat right now. Um, you know who you are, but it's nice to see so many friends that have come through to see me talk about the work and like, you know, all people that are contributing to making this culture too. So it's cool to see everybody in one place. Um, yeah, that's it. Uh, hit me up if you have questions, if you want to talk more, you know, I'm always open to that. Um, give me a shout and have a great rest of your night. Cool. All right. Thanks everyone. Cool. Thanks y'all. Bye-bye. See ya. Thank you.